Hi there, all you cool cats and kittens. I'm Sylvia, and I am here with another true crime case for you guys. This one, since it's October, is also Halloween-themed, hence why I'm dressed up as a leopard. It is hot in my apartment, and I am wearing a fur coat. So please like and subscribe to this video, because I did this for you guys. So please like and subscribe. It is very hot in my apartment, and I'm sure I will be sweating by the end of this video. This case takes place in the fall of 1975 in a town called Greenwich, Connecticut. The leaves are changing, the air is all crisp, and I'm sure that all of the teens at Martha's High School were donning their designer coats and scarves and hats because this was a nice area. And I'm not talking nice like everybody has a pool. I'm talking nice like everybody has a mansion with a pool with a separate pool house to go with the pool. This is like the Yale crowd. It's actually one of the wealthiest communities in the entire country. The Skakel family, who will come into play later, actually lived across the street from the Moxley household and Ethel Skakel, which was not um, within this house. She was like their um, aunt, I guess. She was married to Robert F. Kennedy, the brother of President JFK, who also was a huge uh, hopeful to become president until he was assassinated. Across from the Skakel family lived Martha Moxley, a 15-year-old girl who had just moved to the town only a year earlier. Martha was looking forward to getting up to some teenage mischief this Halloween season, and it was October 30th, which is mischief night in the Greenwich community, and this is basically where the teenagers meet up and go do, like, pranks and stuff. Martha was actually supposed to be grounded that night, but her mom let her go out anyway because it was mischief night and she wanted to be included with all the other kids. She was very popular, she had lots of friends, so she had lots of plans, of course, and the first of which was to go over to the Skakel household. I think she wanted to, like, throw toilet paper onto some, you know, trees and stuff, and then, like, egg some cars, just, like, classic teenage stuff. But this night was about to take a very sharp and terrifying turn for the teenage girl. Martha had gone over to the Skakel household many times before, and she would just go over there when she was bored, and they would all be bored together. Now, what was great about the Skakel household was that Rushton Skakel was hardly ever around, and because their mom had died when they were kids, they basically had run of this entire mansion. This mansion was basically a place where you could drink and do drugs without any parents bothering you. The two boys who lived in the house were Michael and Tom Skagel. Tom also went by Tommy, and he was the older Skagel brother at 17 years old, and Michael was the younger one at 15. Michael and Martha were the same age, Tommy was a little bit older, but they all ran in the same crowd and they all had hung out multiple times together, which Martha detailed in her diary. Tom was the more popular brother, he was athletic, he was funny, he was nice, he had lots of friends, and Michael was just kind of weird. Uh, he didn't really have that social prowess that Tommy had, and um, he was just kind of like the tag-along. They didn't really like him that much. I think that being Tommy's brother and being so wealthy probably gave him basically all of his social capital. He didn't really earn any of it himself. Even though Michael was her own age, Martha had a lot more chemistry with Tommy, which she had detailed in diary entries leading up to her murder. In her diary entries, she just writes about how her day goes and Tommy and Michael's name come up kind of a lot because she was their friend and, you know, they sat together at lunch, they would hang out on the weekends. And one of her diary entries, actually a few weeks leading up to her murder, says this. On September 12th, Martha writes in her diary, everyone went outside and me, Jackie, Michael, Tom, Hope, Maureen, and Audra went driving in Tom's car. I drove a little and then I was practically sitting on Tom's lap because I was only steering and he kept putting his hand on my knee. Then we went to the gazebo and Hope, Mo, Aud and Audrey took off. Then me, Jackie, Margie, Michael, Tom, and Danny went out again and I drove some more and Margie and I kept yelling out the sunroof and then we went to friendlies and Michael treated me and 
The page ends, but basically Michael got her a double scoop of ice cream and she only wanted a single scoop. So she grabs the top scoop and throws it out the fucking window. So Martha's a bit of a savage and I think this is also a good representation of what her relationship was like to both of the boys. And then a few days after they go get ice cream together, Martha writes this. Michael was totally out of it and he was being a real asshole with his actions and words. He kept telling me that I was leading Tom on when I don't like him, except as a friend. Michael jumps to conclusions. I can't be friends with Tom just because I talk to him. It doesn't mean I like him. I really have to stop going over there. Which is very sad knowing that this is what would lead to her death. Martha doesn't stop going over to the Skakel house. She continues going over there even though she can kind of tell at this point that both brothers are romantically interested in her. On October 30th, Mischief Night, several people were hanging out at the Skakel household when Martha arrived. Several witnesses report seeing Tommy and Martha engaging in flirtatious behavior out by their pool house at 9 p.m. Now, shortly after this time, Martha's mother, Dorothy, starts wondering where Martha is because she's grounded, she wasn't supposed to be staying out so late, but at the same time, it's kind of understandable because she's probably not looking at her clock, but 11.30 rolls around, 12.30 rolls around, and Dorothy starts getting worried. So Dorothy starts calling Martha's friends and none of them have seen her. She also calls the Skakel household and Tommy Skakel picks up. And when he hears that she can't find Martha, he's very sincere, he's very concerned. He says, no, she left here shortly after nine. I, am, I don't know where she is, I'm really sorry. And it's past 3 a.m. when Dorothy decides to call the police. This was such a rich area, you know, like old money, like wealthy dynasties practically. So there was hardly any crime at all, let alone a missing persons case. And this is why Martha's case was taken so seriously from the get go, even though it was like a partying night for a lot of the teenagers in the town. However, they search the neighborhood and there's no trace of the beautiful blonde teenager. The next morning, Dorothy is understandably in pieces because she still can't find her daughter and everybody plans on meeting at the Moxley household to continue their search for Martha. This is when at 12 p.m., Sheila McGuire comes running into the front door crying. Sheila had found her friend's body laying under a pine tree in her own yard. Martha was actually on her own property when she was found. Don't know how the police didn't see that. Martha's friends and family are understandably traumatized. There is a bloody, unconscious body laying in their front yard, practically. And it's not just any body, it's the body of Martha Moxley, the person they all loved so much. This was a brutal scene. Martha had been beaten savagely with a six iron golf club. And they know that a golf club was the murder weapon because there were pieces of it laying around her body. And in fact, one of the pieces of the rod of the golf club had been stabbed through her neck. She was beaten so terribly that half of her skull had caved in and in the area where the golf club had been driven through her neck, her hair had actually been pushed through the wound out to the other side. Now, Martha had been hit so hard with this metal club that it actually broke apart. So fragments of it were found on the Moxley property. The head of the golf club had been found on the Moxley driveway and there were several pools of blood indicating that she had been attacked while she was maybe running away. The police examine the pieces that they find of this golf club and they can see that it's very well made. In fact, it's actually a collector's item with limited editions. The only piece that they don't locate of this golf club is the handle, the exact part of it that the assailant would be holding. Martha's jeans and underwear had been pulled down to her knees and the forensic analysis showed that she had not been essayed but this whole investigation was basically botched. Uh, I think it's very clear that this was a crime of passion and had a sexual motive. So I'll get into that later. Her family calls the police. They arrive almost immediately. 
Um, you know, this was such an upscale area that a murder hadn't occurred in 30 years. So these responding officers had probably never even dealt with an actual murder scene before. Now, this becomes a recipe for a botched forensic investigation. Basically, people are walking to and from Martha's body all day. They don't sanction off the crime scene. They don't put a blanket over her body. At one point, the neighbor's dog is even like sniffing around her body and they have to like pull the dog away. So basically any DNA is ruined at this point. A lot of people actually relate this case back to the JonBenet Ramsey case because they both occurred in really upscale communities and the forensic investigation was botched because they didn't follow any protocol. And even without the DNA and forensics, in 1975, the police begin retracing Martha's steps that night and they know that she was home with her family and then she walked over to the Skagel household. They also notice fairly quickly that the Skagel household owns the set of clubs that the murder weapon was pulled from. These clubs were custom made and they actually had one of their family members' names engraved on them. This family is so rich that these nice ass clubs are just laying all over their property. The boys just like to play with them. They were laying all over the place. They weren't like all kept in a set together. So that combined with the fact that she was last seen with Tommy Skakel really set the police on a solid trail. Both Skakel brothers were considered suspects, especially after the police found Martha's diary and how she wrote about how both of them were sexually attracted to her. Both Skakel brothers are interviewed and they both change their alibis multiple times. Tommy said that he went inside and then watched a movie with his live-in tutor. God, these people are rich. And when the movie was over, he went upstairs to write his report on Abraham Lincoln that was due the next day. However, his tutor says that Tommy watched the movie with him around 10.30, not 9.30. And then also when the police started questioning Tommy's teachers, none of them know anything about an Abraham Lincoln assignment. So that's kind of shady. So Michael Skakel comes home a lot later than Tommy, according to his tutor. And according to Michael, he was watching Monty Python at his cousin's house. His cousins never fully corroborated this alibi and it was never confirmed. Now, even though this case had plenty of leads, the Skakel family used their power and influence to shield their sons from the law. Their dad, Rushton Skakel, hired expensive lawyers and sealed off any school or behavioral records from the police. You know, this is a super rich white family. They have a live-in tutor, they have a pool house, and they have a direct relationship to the Kennedy dynasty. I mean, there are rich white people who aren't millionaires who get away with murder. So just imagine how much influence this family has. Um, Rushton Skakel had actually even hired out the police of Greenwich on several different occasions to be his personal bodyguards and to also work security at his house parties. So of course, like they know this guy personally, so why are they gonna fully investigate his sons, especially when he's asking them not to? He was just the kind of dad who would like to throw money at something, but it turns out giving your kids unlimited money so that they can buy alcohol and drugs and not face any consequences for their actions is not a good parenting strategy, and it doesn't make your sons functioning members of society. And this especially proved true for Michael Skakel. Michael Skakel gets addicted to drugs and alcohol before he's even old enough to drink. And in 1978, he gets arrested on a DUI at the age of 18. Once again, his dad hires an attorney to defend Michael and they argue that he's such a promising young man, he doesn't need to go to jail, it's gonna be bad for his reputation, and that's too harsh of a sentence. So he instead is sent to the Elon School for Troubled Youths in Maine. It's not until the late 90s, early 2000s when somebody decides to pick this case back up again. And that person is none other than Mark Furman who worked on the O.J. Simpson trial. He was the disgraced detective who was the first responder to the scene and during the trial, the defense brought out tapes of Furman saying extremely racist comments. He drops the N-word multiple times. 
This basically ruins his credibility and OJ is acquitted. Um, in my opinion, this is what won the case for the defense. I am very interested in this case. I almost wrote about it for my senior thesis. But um, if you guys want me to do a video on the OJ Simpson trial and the murder of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman, uh, just leave a comment down below. I'm happy to do that. But yeah, obviously after this, Mark Furman is not very well respected by society and he decides to start working on cold cases. He's probably like, oh, okay, well, I'll just work on a case where like only white people are involved and then like my racism won't be affected in any way. He doesn't want rich people to get away with murder again, so he decides to start working on Martha's case. Now, basically, the way they crack this case is by seeking out witnesses. They interview people who were there that night on October 30th, 1975, and they also interview people who knew Michael after. It turns out Michael was not as sly as he thought he was. In fact, he had mentioned the night multiple times to people, and even at, during his stint at the Elon school, he had blurted out that he had killed his friend. Um, part of the exercises at the Elon school was that they were grilled on traumatic events of their past, and this is when he admitted to blacking out that night, and he said that he thought he may have killed Martha. In 2001, two of his fellow troubled youths come forward and agree to testify against Michael. One of these students and a key witness for the prosecution was named Gregory Coleman, and he testified he'd even bragged about getting away with murder because he was a Kennedy. Coleman was a drug addict, and he actually ended up passing away from an overdose in 2001. Elizabeth Arnold was another student at the Elon School, and she also said that Michael Michael felt that his brother Tommy, quote, stole his girlfriend. Going back to Martha's diary, she did know that both boys were romantically interested in her, that Michael's upset. And unfortunately for her, she didn't realize that Michael's attraction to her was growing into an obsession. 15 years later, in 1991, Rushton Skagel tried to renew his family's reputation by hiring a PI to investigate this case, but it actually backfires completely because they just find more evidence uh, linking Michael to the case. In this new investigation and their most recent interviews, Tommy said that he and Martha had been doing hand stuff and then she went home. However, however Michael was drunk that night and he said that he went over to the Moxley estate, climbed up into a tree, and masturbated while looking at their illuminated windows through the night. And this tree was actually the same tree that Martha was found underneath. Michael's friend also said that he asked him up front back into... Michael's friend also said that he confronted him about this and asked if he had killed Martha, and Michael vehemently denied this, but did say that he was there that night. Michael even records a book proposal on tape where he talks about Martha's death and he basically just sets himself up to be convicted. Uh, while Tommy was there that night, he had pretty much flown under the radar for the rest of his life and Michael's behavior just got worse over the years. Mark Furman and his team pulled together enough evidence to charge Michael with this crime and in 2001, he's convicted of the murder of Martha Moxley and he's sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. The reality of what happened the night of Martha Moxley's murder is pretty convoluted, especially since Michael never admitted guilt in this case. But basically, off of all the evidence and the articles that I've read, here's what I think happened. I think that Martha and Tommy did hand stuff outside. I think that probably took about an hour, hence why Tommy came into the house at 1030. Michael either saw this happening or he found out about it shortly after the fact and he flew into a rage. He followed Martha home and then beat her with a golf club that he had picked up from the Skakel property. Again, her pants were found at her ankles, but there were no signs of tra genital trauma. So I think that maybe he like pulled down her pants and then masturbated there, hence the story about him masturbating in that tree, because lies a lot of the time have a little bit of truth in them. So I think that that is what happened. Again, I'm not a detective. Skakel family, you're rich. Please don't sue me. But that kind of seems like what happened. Unfortunately, in 2013, 
After serving 11 years in prison, Michael's lawyer gets him out on a $1.3 million bond. The Stanford Superior Court ruled that there was not enough evidence to convict him without a reasonable doubt. Basically, the reason he got out was because a lot of the people who played a part in convicting Michael were drug addicts when they were testifying against him. Um, Michael also was under intense pressure when he admitted to killing Martha at the Elon School. Um, so the New York Times wrote an article on in the early 2000s about the Elon School and basically exposed them for all of their brutal punishments and controversial therapy tactics that they would do on their students. When you look into these, they're actually really degrading and sad. Humiliation was a huge part of their punishment system and they would make students take their clothes off or dress up in degrading costumes and do degrading acts. Um, one girl had to wear like a sign around her neck that was like, I'm a pathetic human being and all I want is attention and I try to force people to love me and like I'm always going to be like this. And then um, Michael had to wear something around his neck that was like, ask me why I killed my friend Martha. Um, and then another story was where a student asked if they could get a dog for their dorm. And instead of getting a dog, the people who ran this school decided that the student would be the dog. And they forced him to crawl around on all fours and eat out of a dog bowl for the next few days. Another girl had had sex, which is against the rules of the school, and her punishment was to dress up as a stripper and dance in front of everybody. This is, you know, obviously like really fucked up and sad. I think that kind of like gives a little bit more reasoning to why Michael is now walking free. So um, in 2020, the state of Connecticut turned down a retrial for Michael's case. Uh, this rosy-cheeked boy is now walking free and he once again is above the law. Dorothy Moxley, Martha's mother, is now 86 and Martha died when she was in her 40s. So she's lived half of her life with this case on her mind. In an interview, she said that she's grateful that Michael spent 11 years behind bars and it's disappointing that he's out now. However, um, it's such a deep pain that she's having to live with regardless of where Michael is. So that's all I have on the Halloween murder of Martha Moxley. I hope you enjoyed this video and my leopard costume. If you did, please leave me a thumbs up and comment below some other cases that you'd like me to cover. Thank you so much and I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day and stay safe.